Hi, right, engineers. In this video today, we're going to be talking about the function of lysosomes and then the lysosomal storage disorders. Before we get into this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll link to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account. Go check those out. All right, engineers, let's get into it. All right, engineers, so when we talk about lysosomes, we talked a little bit about them, their overall kind of design, their structure, their basic function in the video on the structure and function of the, of the cell. But what we need to do is kind of dig in a little bit deeper into the lysosomes and what they do. The reason why is, if we understand the function of lysosomes at a little bit more of a greater detail, it's much, much easier to understand the lysosomal storage disorders. So, let's start off talking about how lysosomes work. Well, the first thing that you need to know before how lysosomes work is how they're actually made. We briefly talked about this in the structure and function of the cell. But if you remember, we start off when we're making proteins, because that's what pretty much the components of lysosomes is these enzymes. And enzymes are proteins. So we start off with, remember the DNA? What, what is it called whenever you go from DNA to mRNA? It's called transcription. So we take and we make mRNA from DNA via the process of transcription in the nucleus. Then out of the nucleus, what happens? It moves via the nuclear pores and binds with a particular structure out here, which is called a ribosome. The ribosome will then begin to translate parts of that protein. Well, let's represent that as like this brown thing coming out this portion of it. So it's translating the mRNA and making proteins. What happens is this ribosome will get then kind of like a magnet sucked onto the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So you see the structure here that's in this maroon organelle here? This is called our rough endoplasmic reticulum. The mRNA will get translated into proteins taken up into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You know what the rough ER does? It pushes this protein. Once this actual ribosome moves over to the rough ER, so look, here's going to be our mRNA right there. It's getting translated, and it's translating this protein into the rough ER. As it goes to the rough ER, let's imagine here is going to be our protein. You know proteins are special because on one end, they have a amino end, and on the other end, they have a carboxyl end. And all the little components that make them up are called amino acids. What the rough ER does is it folds this protein in a particular way. And then you know what else is really important? This is very relevant. It takes a particular enzyme and uses the enzyme in the rough ER and adds on a sugar residue to this amine group of the protein. You know what this little sugar is called? It's called mannose. It's called a mannose sugar. But this process by which the rough ER adds the mannose sugar onto the N structure, the nitrogen of the protein, is called N-linked glycosylation. What is this called? N-linked glycosylation. This is a very special activity that the rough endoplasmic reticulum performs. Then, after it does this process, it then packages that actual protein with this mannose sugar into a vesicle. Look at this vesicle. Here's that vesicle coming off of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. What's going to be inside of it? You're going to have your protein, and what's going to be coming off the in the nitrogen of that actual protein? A sugar residue, right? The mannose group. Now, from the rough ER, we have to send this to the Golgi. Very important, especially for US, USMLE step one, there's very important proteins that are found on these vesicles going from the rough endoplasmic reticulum towards the Golgi. What are these proteins? They guide this like a magnet, like zoop, right to the Golgi. What are these called? These proteins that guide this vesicle to the Golgi are called COP2 proteins. COP2 proteins. They bind to the vesicle of the rough ER and take it to the Golgi. Now, in the Golgi, this protein with the mannose sugar gets kind of budded into this. So here we're going to have that protein right there. And then again, what's coming off of that protein, off the nitrogen? The mannose. This actual Golgi, what is this organelle here? This is called your Golgi. It does something very special. Everything does something special, I guess, right? Let's, again, take our protein. Here we have it. We're going to the Golgi. As you go to the Golgi, the Golgi does something else. It adds a phosphate group onto this mannose sugar. So here, let's actually draw kind of our protein here. Here's our protein. We have the carboxyl end here. We have the nitrogen end here. And then again, what's coming off of this? 
you're gonna have your mannose sugar. And then off that mannose sugar, what does the Golgi add on here? Let's actually do a special color here. Let's use orange. What the Golgi does is, is it actually adds in a phosphate group. You see this phosphate here? We're gonna add this into this reaction. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this phosphate onto the mannose sugar, on the six carbon of it. This is a very important reaction. This is called phosphorylation, right? This is called phosphorylation. The reason why this is important for your USMLEs, step one is because there's a disease called eye cell disease. It's called eye cell disease. And this disease is usually whenever the Golgi is unable to add a phosphate group onto the mannose of proteins. And so because you don't have that phosphate, why is that important? Why am I stressing on that? Here's why. From the Golgi, guess what? In order for these vesicles to butt off and become lysosomes. So from the Golgi, we're gonna butt off a vesicle and we want those vesicles containing this protein to become a lysosome. We need this phosphate group onto it. If that phosphate group is not on that mannose of the protein, we will not make functional lysosomes enzymes. So because of that, we need that actual phosphate to be there. If it is not, we will not make lysosomes. That is why it's important. Okay, so now, to quickly recap, we took mRNA, we translated into proteins, stuffed it into the rough ER, it added a sugar residue, used the COP2 to send it to the Golgi, Golgi then added a phosphate onto the mannose. That phosphate, when it's added onto the mannose sugar that's bound to the, uh, to the actual protein molecule, it's then destined to become lysosomes. If that process of phosphorylation does not occur, this is called eye cell disease. Okay, we've made our lysosomes. Once we've made our lysosomes, we now need to know what the heck these little buggers do. There's very important processes called endocytosis. So what is this called? Endocytosis. Endocytosis is the process by which you bring substances or macromolecules into the cell. There's two main types that are important with respect to the lysosomes. The first one is called phagocytosis. So it's called phagocytosis. And this is very, very important within your white blood cells. You know macrophages, neutrophils, which are your white blood cells, they love to engulf, take in what types of things? Pathogens. What is a very, very dangerous pathogen? Like one of them, there's many of them. But one that we encounter is bacteria. And what happens is these bacteria can get engulfed by white blood cells like macrophages and neutrophils and brought into the cell. When they're brought into the cell via this process of phagocytosis, guess what it does? It takes and actually creates a little vesicle, like an endosome, if you will. And this endosome contains the bacteria in it. Now, this actual endosome, when it's with respect to phagocytosis, it's given a special name. It's called a phagosome. It's called a phagosome. What happens is that phagosome, which contains the pathogen, what type of molecule in here? It contains the bacteria. It then gets combined with a lysosome. What are these molecules? These are called your lysosomes. Once the lysosome combines with the phagosome, now look at this. We're gonna have, here's the lysosome with all these nasty little enzymes. And then over here, we're gonna have the phagosome which combines, and it's gonna have the bacteria. Here's what I want you to remember. These lysosomes contain very dangerous enzymes. We already talked about how we synthesize these enzymes, but we need to talk about what these enzymes are. They contain very nasty hydrolytic enzymes. That just means it breaks down substances by adding water into it. And these hydrolytic enzymes, they can be proteases, nucleases, lipases, glucosidases, which means it breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. You know what a bacteria is made up of? All those macromolecules. So guess what the lysosome will do? It gonna frick it up. It's gonna come in there and start breaking down the proteins, the nucleic acids, the lipids, all of that stuff until it's all digested. That is what the lysosome will do. So the lysosome will actually do what? It'll break down the bacteria. 
And then in certain cells, like neutrophils, guess what that'll do with that actual lysosome, which contains all the broken down, maybe remaining products. It'll then take and spit it out of the cell. So that's one thing that you need to know with the lysosomes. Very important when it comes to these white blood cells. The next one is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. What the heck is that? That's a big name, right? Receptor-mediated. So we need an example of a receptor and then a molecule that binds to that receptor. The most classically used examples is LDL, which is a lipoprotein, bad cholesterol. And then there's a particular molecule that that LDL binds to, <laughs> the LDL receptor. Pretty straightforward, right? This happens on the liver. When LDL binds onto this LDL receptor in the liver, there's little proteins. You know, there's these special little proteins called clathrins. What are they called here? We're gonna put, look at this, C. These are called clathrins. And what the clathrin molecules do is they bind to the membrane, which has the LDL receptor and the LDL bound to it, and creates a little invagination called a clathrin-coated pit. Then it continues to pull, 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 pull until it invaginates and creates a vesicle or an endosome. So then look what will happen as a result of this. Through this process of, what is it called? Receptor-mediated endocytosis. We're going to take in this little structure here. So now we're gonna have a vesicle, and that vesicle is actually gonna be called a endosome. That's what we like to call it, an endosome. Just like a phagosome is an endosome, it's just a special name from the process of phagocytosis. What does the endosome contain within it? It has the LDL receptors, and then it also has the LDL molecules bound to it. Guess what happens with this endosome? The endosome has little like, pumps on it, little proton pumps. And these little proton pumps, they start pushing in lots of Protons, making this environment very acidic. You want to know what that protons do whenever they get pumped into this environment? They make the bond between the LDL receptor and the LDL very weak so that they disassociate from one another. So then as a process of this, look what will happen as a result of this. As the protons get pumped in, look at this. Let's kind of see what happens here. You're going to get kind of like a little bubbled vesicle here like a little bubbled one here, right? And then what happens is, as the process of these protons coming in, it separates the LDL receptors away from the LDL molecules. Then, after that process, guess what happens? We pinch this off and separate this into two separate vesicles. So now we're gonna have that, and we're gonna have this. And then you're gonna have this vesicle here which contains the LDL receptors, and this vesicle here, which is gonna contain the LDL molecules. Guess where the LDL molecules will go? Well, they're a type of macromolecule. They will get sent to this lysosome. And when they get sent to the lysosome, guess what they're gonna do? The lysosomes contain specific types of lipases and sphingomyelinases and all these different enzymes that'll break down the cholesterol, the phospholipids, the proteins, all of the stuff within the LDL molecule. So what else will it break down? Not just the bacteria, but it'll also break down in this example, since we're using this example, the bacteria and the LDL particle. The question is, is what the heck happens to this little receptor here? Just to finish the story, because I know you guys are begging to know what happened, right? You know our, our cells are so cool. You know what they do with these LDL molecules? They send them to get recycled. So they get recycled and sent right back to the cell membrane to rebind into the plasma membrane and express these LDL receptors so that the next LDL can bind, bring it in and do the same process. Now again, you need to understand what the fate is of this lysosome. We understand it breaks down macromolecules from particle matter via phagocytosis, or breaks down macromolecules from receptor-mediated endocytosis. Once it breaks all these things down, the important thing to remember is what happens with this actual lysosome. So let's say it's, it's performed its function, it's broken down all these macromolecules and bacteria. Once it's done that, it's called a secondary lysosome. There's two things that can happen with this secondary lysosome. It can spit some of these molecules out into the cytosol that maybe can be used for certain metabolic pathways, or you know what else it can do? 
it can go to the cell membrane, bind with the cell membrane, and release some of these molecules out of the cell via a process called exocytosis. So now you guys should understand with a quick, quick recap, lysosomes break down macromolecules within a bunch of different ways, right? Primarily via these hydrolytic enzymes. It can break down macromolecules for the process of phagocytosis, break down molecules from the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis. After it breaks it down, it can spit some of these molecules out into the cytosol, or it can spit it out of the cell via exocytosis. The last thing you need to know about the lysosomes, sometimes our cells, we have organelles that they just reach their prime. They're kaput, they're old geezers, they're done like mitochondria and specific types of proteins within the cell. When these things have been worn out, let's actually kind of, let's tag them as that. We're gonna say that these are worn <laughs> out organelles, okay? Or different, you know, protein elements, whether it be mitochondria, cytoskeletal structures, whatever. When they're worn out, they get tagged with like specific molecules. And you know what this tag does? It says, hey, these, these organelles are done. It's time for them to go. So our cell creates a little membrane around them. It creates a little membrane around it. So now I'm gonna have a membrane around these organelles. So what will I have in here? Well, my example was I had a mitochondria, and then I also had a protein molecule here. What happens is once you do this, you take and engulf your own organelles that are done, worn out, this is called a auto, phagosome. It's another type of endosome. This autophagosome, guess what it's going to do? It's going to get taken to the lysosomes. And when it gets taken to the lysosomes, guess what the lysosomes are going to do? They're going to break down the mi mitochondria. What's the mitochondria made up of? It has lipids. It has proteins. It even has a little bit of nucleic acid in there. It's going to break all that down. It's going to break down the protein elements. All of that stuff will get broken down. So not only can it break down bacteria and LDLs, but this process by which you can break down worn out organelles, what is this called? This process is called, we're going to note it up here. This process where we break down these elements here, this is called autophagy. Very important process. This is very important so that we understand the function of lysosomes. Now that we understand the function of lysosomes, how they carry out these activities, now let's talk about lysosomal storage disorders whenever these normal functional pathways aren't occurring normally. All right, so we know that lysosomes have these very nasty hydrolytic enzymes, right? So if we took a look at these lysosomes, we understand that these lysosomes release a lot of hydrolytic enzymes. And again, there's, there's different kinds like lipases, there's what's called uh, uh, proteases, nucleases, and these are just like the broad category of them. There's glucosidases, and there's many other different types of enzymes, but these are your hydrolytic enzymes, and they're responsible for breaking down macromolecules. So again, these are just the general understanding of your hydrolytic enzymes. The reason why all of this is important is that there's genetic conditions in which the lysosomes aren't being able to break down those macromolecules, whether it be a lipid, a protein, a nucleic acid, or a sugar molecule. And that leads to these common diseases, which are very high yield for USMLE step one. What are some of these? Well, one of them is Tay-Sachs disease. Now, Tay-Sachs disease has a particular enzyme, a particular hydrolytic enzyme, that as you can see here, I have the shape of him, which is gonna tell you pretty much the actual enzyme. This enzyme is called hexaminidase A. This hexaminidase A is responsible for breaking down a particular type of macromolecule. And this macromolecule is called a GM2 ganglioside. Ganglioside. Why is this important? If there is a deficiency or loss of this enzyme, there is an accumulation of this GM2 ganglioside. If that GM2 ganglioside, that 
substrate macromolecule builds up in particular tissues, it's going to cause damage to that tissue. Another important fact here is that this disorder, this Tay-Sachs disease, is autosomal recessive. Okay, it's, it's autosomal recessive. So you need two mutant copies in order to have this condition. Now, what tissues does this GM2 ganglioside usually accumulate within? The primary area that it accumulates in is in the central nervous system. And as these actual GM2 ganglicides accumulate within the central nervous system, it leads to progressive neuro neurodegeneration. So it's gonna to lead to neurodegeneration. And this neurodegeneration is the classic sign that you're gonna see. Now, what are some of the ways that we can see this neurodegeneration? Well, one of these ways is hyperreflexia, so increased deep tendon reflexes. That's one big one. Another one is called hyperacusis, where they have very, very uh, like sensitivity to hearing, very you know, very sensi uh, intense sensitivity to hearing. And the other one here is they have seizures because of these deposits within the tissue. And here's a very big fact. On the retina, they have an accumulation of this tissue near the macula, and this leads to what's called a cherry red spot on the macula near the retina. That's an important fact. Now, lysosomes are very, very abundant in our actual what, uh, what types of tissues. Well, obviously, white blood cells is a big one, but what did we notice was another one, the liver. Here's one big thing that you need to remember. Tay-Sachs disease is one of the few lysosomal disorders where there is no hepatomegaly. As you can see, most of these have livers around them. This one has no hepatomegaly. And the reason why I want to help you guys to understand this is that usually Tay-Sachs disease and neiman pick disease can somewhat present similarly. But one of the big differences between Tay-Sachs and neiman pick is that there is no hepatomegaly in Tay-Sachs disease. All right, beautiful. We, know, we understand Tay-Sachs disease. Hex A deficiency, accumulation of GM2 ganglioside, autosomal recessive, neurodegeneration, no hepatomegaly. What about the next one? Fabry's disease. Fabry's disease is actually a deficiency or a loss of alpha galactosidase. So what is this enzyme here called? It is called alpha galactosidase. Alpha galactosidase breaks down one heck of a son of a gun of a substrate, and this substrate is called ceramide trihexoside. Trihexoside. So, in this condition, which this condition is autosome, I'm sorry, X linked recessive. This is X linked recessive. So, you're going to see this more commonly in what sex, male or females? Male. So, in this disease, there is a mutation where there is a loss of alpha galactosidase, which creates an accumulation of ceramide trihexoside within particular tissues. What are these particular tissues? This one's a son of a gun. So I tried to find a mnemonic for these ones, and the big thing that you can remember is Fabry C. Fabry C. So F for foamy urine. And that helps you to remember that this is usually due to kidney failure. Okay, so this will usually be due to the renal failure. Okay, that's the first one. The second one is A, and this is for angiokeratoma. Angiokeratoma, these like little red spots that you can develop within the skin. B is for burning pain in the hands and the feet. This is indicative of neuropathy. R is for really dry skin. Really dry skin. And this is indicative of a condition where you don't make a lot of sweat called hypohydrosis. The next one is that this is only going to be seen in males. Only males have a Y chromosome. And the last one here is that it's also going to be accumulating within the heart tissue. And this leads to cardiovascular disease. 
This is Fabry's disease. Deficiency or loss of alpha-galactosidase, accumulation of ceramide trioxide, X-linked recessive, foamy urine, angiochemeratoma, burning pain, really dry skin, only really seen in males, and cardiovascular disease. Boom, roasted, let's move on to the most common, Gaucher's disease. All right, the next one, this is gonna be the most common lysosomal storage disorder. So therefore, that's a very important thing that you guys need to remember. This is the most common lysosomal storage disease. Now, again, there is an accumulation of a particular substrate due to the loss of a particular hydrolytic enzyme. That hydrolytic enzyme, you can remember beta-glucosidase, but the other name for it is called glucocerebrosidase. The only reason I say this one is because guess what the substrate's name is? It's called glucocerebroside. So in this condition, which is autosomal recessive, an easy way to remember these is that all of them are autosomal recessive except for Fabry's, which is X-linked recessive. This is autosomal recessive. In this condition, there is a loss of glucocerebrosidase or beta-glucosidase, and therefore an accumulation of glucocerebroside within the particular tissues. What tissues does this glucocerebroside like to accumulate in? The bone tissue. You know, particular portion of the bone tissue that's very important? The red bone marrow. Guess what happens if this kind of accumulates within the red bone marrow and affects the activity of the red bone marrow? What does the red bone marrow make? It makes red blood cells, it makes white blood cells, and it also makes platelets. If these accumulate, it's going to damage the red bone marrow. What's going to happen to the number of platelets? Decrease. Red blood cells? Decrease. White blood cells? Decrease. What is this called? Pancytopenia. Pan cytopenia. That's one thing. The other thing is that it can actually accumulate within the bone and lead to bone infarctions, which is called a bone crisis. So it can lead to avascular necrosis of the bone. And the other thing is if, if this is actually continuous over time, it can lead to early onset osteoporosis. So it can also really damage the bone tissue and lead to osteoporosis. The next thing is if these little molecules, these glucocerebrosides accumulate within the liver and accumulate within the spleen, guess what this is called? This is called hepatosplenomegaly. This is called hepatomegaly. And then for the spleen, this is called splenomegaly. Very, very important for these. The next thing, this is a very, very high yield, very commonly asked on the USMLE step one. You know, remember we said that macrophages are very important because they contain lysosomes that break down a lot of bacteria and substances? If these glucocerebroside molecules accumulate with inside of the macrophages, it produces a very classical type of cell. We call these cells Gaucher cells. You can see this under microscopy. And it's basically where the glucocerebroside, which is a type of lipid, these are all what's called sphingolipidoses. If this accumulates, these lipids, it leads to lots of lipid inclusions accumulating within these macrophages, and this is called Gaucher cells. And where do they love to be found? The spleen, the liver, and in the bone tissue. Okay, the last one, which is Neiman-Pick disease. Now, Neiman-Pick disease is actually, again, an autosomal recessive disorder. So again, what is this disease? This is autosomal recessive. Again, all of them are autosomal recessive, except for which one again? Fabry's, which is X-linked, right? And you can remember the mnemonic because they only have a Y chromosome in males. Now, the particular enzyme, hydrolytic enzyme, that is actually going to be lost in this, look at this little dude. This is shaped like an S. This is called sphingo, sphingo myelinase. This enzyme is absent or super deficient and therefore not able to break down the particular substrate it breaks down, which is called Oh, thank, thank goodness, it's a super, super simple one, sphingomyelin. So in this autosomal recessive disorder where you have no sphingomyelinase, you don't break down sphingomyelin and it accumulates within particular tissues. What are the particular tissues it accumulates in? Remember, we said this is very similar to Tay-Sachs disease. The only thing that's different with Tay-Sachs 
is that it does not have hepatomegaly. So in that case, we already can answer these two quick ones here. It accumulates within the liver and within the spleen. What is this called collectively whenever they get enlarged because of that accumulation? It's called hepatosplenomegaly. The next thing that's important here, it also loves to accumulate within the brain tissue. And when it accumulates within the brain tissue, it leads to neurodegeneration. So again, you're gonna see that neurodegeneration. But here's the big thing here. We remember in the um, Tay-Sachs, there was hyperacusis, hyperreflexia, and there was even um, some of that cherry red spot. This has some of the similar features. It's still gonna have like seizures and developmental delays, but the big thing here is it also has a cherry red spot that accumulates on the macula within the retina. So which ones both have cherry red spots? neiman pick disease and Tay-Sachs disease. What's the big difference between them? The Tay-Sachs has no hepatomegaly and neiman pick disease has hepatosplenomegaly. One more thing that you need to know for neiman pick disease is that again, macrophages are important for, you know, uh, they have lots of lysosomes to break down certain bacteria. If these sphingomyelin molecules accumulate, it's gonna produce, again, a lot of lipid inclusions that accumulate within these macrophages. So these are called, whenever they have a lot of these lipids, they love to call these, remember how these were called Gaucher cells? They love to call these foam cells. Foam cells. One other important high yield fact is if you have these, when you're comparing these two, because you're like, oh wow, this has a lot of lipids, this has a lot of lipids. How do I know the difference? Well, one thing is the dependent upon the substrate, but here's another thing, they gotta try to make it a little easy. When you look at this under a microscope, Gaucher cells look like crumpled tissue paper. And that is a very important thing to remember for you USMLE step ones. So again, crumpled tissue paper, Gaucher cells. Lots of lipid accumulation and foam cells. These are gonna be the neiman pick disease types of uh, macrophage accumulation with lipids. So again, that covers the lysosomal storage diseases. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about lysosomes and lysosomal storage disorders. I hope this made sense and I hope that it helped. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.